Good morning, class. Our topic for this morning would be the blood and tissue nematodes. So I've placed here the different blood and tissue nematodes you might be encountering, especially when you have your lecture class. But for our laboratory, we'll mainly be focusing on the filarial worms, trichinella, and the worms that cause visceral larva migrans. So the filarial worms are divided based on what part of the human body they inhabit. We have the lymphatic filarial worms. This consists of Wuchereria and Brugia. We have the subcutaneous filarial worms. That would be your Onchocerca, Loa Loa, and two species from the Mancinella genus. And then we have the serous cavity filarial worms. That would be Mancinella perstans. Next, we have Trichinella spiralis, which is a nematode that inhabits the skeletal and cardiac muscles of humans. And then we have the Toxocara genus, which causes visceral larva migrants. Lastly, we have here at the bottom, Dracunculus medinensis, but that will be tackled more on your lecture classes. So let's start with our lymphatic filarial worms. First off, we have Vucereria bancrofti, which is much more common than Brugia malayi. So based on the name, it causes Bancroftian filariasis, and the characteristic of lymphatic filariasis would be lymphangiectasia. So imagine that you have a node that is caused by the coiling of the adult worms found in the lymph vessels of the infected host. This causes then proximal dilation of the lymph vessels, and that's how we get lymphangiectasia when we do physical examination on patients who are infected with lymphatic filarial worms. Now, the larvae of our filarial worms are called microfilariae. This is their L1 larvae. So for Wuchereria, their microfilariae are sheathed in a hyaline sheath. So they're sort of like clothes. They have clothes, and oftentimes this hyaline sheath would remain unstained or only very lightly stained when we do our blood smears. The microfilariae also exhibit smooth, graceful curves along their bodies, and they also have two to three rows of distinctly conspicuous nuclei, meaning that if you look at the body of the L1 larvae, you will be able to appreciate distinct circles along the length of its body. And at the tail portion of our Wuchereria microfilariae, we won't be able to appreciate any terminal nuclei. So at the tail end, it's just an empty space. Filariasis, whether it be in the lymphatics, in the subcutaneous tissues, or in the serous cavities, will always be transmitted by an arthropod vector. So for Wuchereria, we have three genuses of mosquitoes that can transmit this infection. That includes Aedes, Culex, and Anopheles. This information was taken from the CDC, wherein they mentioned these three vectors. So let's talk first about Brugia before we compare and contrast their morphological differences with Wuchereria. Now, Brugia is a pathogenic agent that causes Malayan filariasis. It's transmitted by the mosquito vectors of the genus Mansonia and Aedes, and the diagnostic stage would still also be the microfilariae or the L1 larvae. So the appearance of these microfilariae they would have a headspace of at least two is to one. Later on, we'll look at the photos of that so that we can imagine that more in the following slides. They will exhibit rigid, angular, kinky curves along their bodies. And in contrast to Wuchereria, wherein you will see conspicuous nuclei along the length of the microfilariae, the nuclei of Brugia microfilariae will not be clearly appreciable. In many cases, when you see peripheral blood smears that contain the Brugia microfilariae, the body will only contain what appears to be a mass of purple or a mass of blue nuclei that are overlapping. Also this time, at the tip of the tail of the Brugia microfilariae, there will be two distinct terminal nuclei, in contrast with Wuchereria, which does not have the terminal nuclei. So Wuchereria and Brugia have similar life cycles. Let's start off with a third stage infective larvae, that's your L3, entering the blood through the wound made by the mosquito. They then migrate to the nearest lymph gland, 
where they will mature into the thread-like adult worms about three months to one year later. The average incubation time before patency is about 15 months. The mature adults can survive about 5 to 10 years and cause damage of the lymphatic vessels, and this causes the host immune response to become activated. That's how patients end up with lymphangiectasia and the signs and symptoms of lymphatic filariasis. So once the male and female nematodes mate, the female will produce live young, which are your L1 larvae or your microfilariae. They then move through the circulatory system and collect in arterioles of the lung during the day and emerge at night. So for Wuchereria and Brugia, these two species have nocturnal periodicity because it's at night when their mosquitoes are most active and feeding. So once the microfilariae have entered an appropriate mosquito host through its blood meal, they penetrate the insect's gut and move to the thoracic muscles where they mature through two life stages, becoming the third stage infective L3 larvae once again. And then the cycle will start all over again with a new host, with new mosquito vectors, and etc. The microfilariae of both Wuchereria and Brugia are sheathed, but for Wuchereria, the hyaline sheath is unstained or only lightly staining, even with GEMSA or H&E. The hyaline sheath of Brugia, on the other hand, will be seen as pink or purple, like here in the photos on the left for Wuchereria and on the right for Brugia. For Wuchereria, you're also able to appreciate the nuclei along the body of the worm. So that's those individual circles that you can see along the length of the body. But the nuclei along the body of Brugia are overlapping. They're inconspicuous, they're indistinct. So in many cases, when you look at the microfilariae of Brugia, all you will see is a continuous blurry purple staining, pink staining, or blue staining mass along the body. The body of Wuchereria also exhibits smooth, graceful, continuous curves. Meanwhile, for Brugia, the worm can be seen as having more curves along its body. The cephalic space of Wuchereria, which is the area encircled in the photo on the left, is as tall as it is wide. For Brugia, the cephalic space is at least 2 is to 1, meaning that the area is taller than it is wide. Lastly, there are no nuclei at the tip of the tail for Wuchereria, so that's the area that is pointed by the arrow. But for Brugia, there are two distinct terminal nuclei. So lymphatic filariasis manifests because of the immune response of the body to the presence of the worms. The worms themselves do not secrete any toxins, inflammatory proteins, and etc. So the disease is a hypersensitivity reaction to the infection. Now going back to the life cycle, the L3 become adults in the lymphatic vessels and they will become coiled there, eventually causing blockage. Dilation of lymphatics causes an increased secretion of proteinaceous material from the lymphatics into the surrounding tissue, and this leads to the formation of conspicuous lymphedema and thickening of the endothelium. The lymphangitis is followed by necrosis, sclerosis, and obstruction of these vessels proximal to the lymph nodes. Now, the obstruction of the lymph flow results in elephantiasis, which is a classical and most common feature of filarial infection. In cases of hydrocele, which is the swelling of the scrotal sac, the usual culprit would be Wuchereria. Brugia, meanwhile, has a propensity to inhabit the limb lymphatics, thereby more often causing elephantiasis. Acute disease with this infection is characterized by lymphatic involvement manifesting as episodic tenderness and swelling of the affected limb with red streaks along the course of the lymphatic vessels and lymph node enlargement or lymphedema. This will be further discussed during your lecture class. 
Tropical pulmonary eosinophilia is caused by the presence of microfilariae in the pulmonary circulation. Because remember that these larvae can be seen in the peripheral blood only at night and are located in the lungs during the day. So their presence in the lung tissue causes a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction and the worms eventually become enclosed in a granuloma known as a Meyers Cohenar body. Chronic disease occurs during the obstructive phase when the afferent lymphatics that drain the affected limb have become fibrotic. So this usually takes around 10 years to develop. Typical manifestations would include lymph varices, elephantiasis, and hydrocele. Chyluria, which results from the rupture of dilated lymphatics into the renal pelvis, can occur as a manifestation of Bancroftian filariasis because remember that these are the worms that would like to inhabit the scrotal lymphatics. Microscopic hematuria and proteinuria are also found in infected patients. The lymphatic filarial worms can be diagnosed best by doing peripheral blood smear then staining with GEMSA or HME. Remember that the microfilariae are found in the blood at night. So that's why it's best to draw blood from our patient between 8 p.m. and 4 a.m. So for these nocturnally periodic parasites, we can also do diethylcarbamazine provocative test. Giving the patient this medicine causes irritation to the microfilariae, and this makes them come out into the peripheral blood during the day making it easier for us to collect specimens. There are also serological tests that allow diagnosis of infection. The knot concentration technique is just a modification of how we collect your blood from the patient. So essentially what we do here is we have a solution that's used to lyse the RBCs, thereby we collect greater yield of the microfilariae if there is actually an infection in our patient. So next off, we have Loa Loa, which is also known as the African eye worm. So for this parasite, their vectors are flies from the genus Chrysops. Common names are deer fly and mango fly. The microfilariae of Loa Loa are also sheathed, just like with your lymphatic filarial worms, and the body nuclei are coarse and crowded, and also extend up to the tip of the tail. We will see photos of that later. There are irregular angular curves or it often has a corkscrew appearance and the tail is often recurved. So in other words, if you look at the tail end of Loa Loa, it will seem like a hook. So both of these photos show you the Loa Loa microfilariae. If you will look at the tail portion of the microfilarial worm, you can see that it looks like a hook. And again, the body nuclei are coarse and crowded. So it also has somewhat of a blurred or inconspicuous appearance similar to Brugia. And also remember that for Loa Loa, it has coarse curves along its body. So now let's talk about the life cycle of Loa Loa. During a blood meal, an infected fly of the genus Chrysops, which are day-biting flies, introduces the third stage filarial larvae into the skin of the human host. The larvae develop into adults that commonly reside in the subcutaneous tissue. Adult worms would migrate in the subcutaneous tissues, mating and producing more larvae. Eventually, microfilariae are released by the female adult, and during the day, they are found in the peripheral blood, but during the non-circulation phase, they are found inside the lungs. The first sign of infection is often painful localized subcutaneous non-pitting edema called calabar or fugitive swelling. That's those two photos on the left and also in the middle. They typically last a few days and then subside, although with recurrent swellings at the same site, these may eventually lead to a permanent cyst-like protuberance. These swellings may result from hypersensitivity to the adult worm or to materials elaborated by it. Eosinophilia may be as high as 90% and often is 60 to 80%. Now the worms may be noticed subcutaneously in the fingers, breasts, eyelids, or submucosally under the conjunctivi, just like what you can see here in the photo in the right. The wanderings of the adult parasite 
may be noticed because of a tingling and creeping sensation. So I just want you guys to note that what is migrating throughout the different subcutaneous tissues are the adult worms. They don't stay in one place. They like to go to different organs throughout their life cycle. Now, obviously, if we see the adult worms on the eyes of the patient, that is an obvious diagnosis of loa loa. We can also do, again, thick or thin blood smear that can be modified by the knots concentration technique and then staining with GEMSA or H&E. For loa loa, please, again, take note that the microfilariae exhibit diurnal periodicity, meaning that they come out into the blood during the day, so it's best to collect blood from our patient during the time of 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. In some cases, although this is quite infrequent, they may also be found in spinal fluid, in urine, and also sputum. The second subcutaneous filarial verb we'll be talking about is Oncocerca volvulus. So this is the pathogenic agent that causes river blindness, which is the leading cause of preventable blindness in sub-Saharan Africa. So the vector for this one would be your simulium fly. Common names would be the black fly, the turkey gnat, and the buffalo gnat. So that's what you can see here at the bottom right of this slide. The microfilariae this time are unsheathed and they have no terminal nuclei. So similar to Wucheraria, there are no nuclei at the tail portion of this microfilarial worm. So here is the life cycle of Oncocerca volvulus. When the female black fly takes a blood meal, the L3 larvae pass into the human bloodstream. From here, the L3 migrate to the subcutaneous tissues where they form nodules and mature into adult worms over a period of 6 to 12 months. The microfilariae are released and migrate to different subcutaneous tissues. And then the microfilariae are taken up by a female black fly when it takes a blood meal, thus completing the life cycle of Oncocerca. So the microfilariae of Oncocerca volvulus are found in the dermis layer of the skin in the host. So when a female simoleum black fly takes a blood meal from an infected host, the microfilariae are also ingested. So please take note that both the adults and the microfilariae are found in the subcutaneous tissues. This time, the microfilarial worms are not in the blood, but in the tissues alongside or in the same area as the adult worms. So infection with Oncocerca would manifest in two main organs. That would be in the skin and also in the eyes. So in the skin, the patient would experience lymphadenopathy and generalized pruritus. Please contrast this to the locally pruritic edema known as a calabar swelling that is seen in loa loa infection. So because the adult worms are found in nodules in the skin or in the subcutaneous tissues, patients might also develop this oncosarcoma. So an example of that can be seen in the top photo. So these are subcutaneous nodules that contain a fibrous capsule that has surrounded the adult worm. Because the adult worms do not migrate anywhere, they stay in one place within the subcutaneous tissue, thereby allowing the human body to have time to host an immune response, cause the formation of a granuloma, and we see that as an oncosarcoma. Other than that, with chronic cutaneous oncocerciasis or oncodermatitis, there will be breakdown of the different proteins and fibers inside the skin. There will also be damage to the cells that cause or give pigmentation to the skin. So some patients might have leopard, lizard, or elephant skin. So that's what you can see here at the photo on the bottom left. There's also hanging groin deformity, which is due to the loss of elastic fibers in the groin area. So that's that photo there on the bottom right. In the eyes, the most serious clinical manifestation would be river blindness. And this is due to the migration of the microfilariae, not the adults, in the interstitial tissues of the eye. So patients who are given diethylcarbamazine when they are infected with Oncocerca 
will have this Mazzotti reaction. So the Mazzotti reaction is a hypersensitivity or an exaggerated immune response to the death of the worms. That's why with Oncocerca, the treatment of choice is not DEC, it is Ivermectin. Meanwhile, for Vucereria, Brugia, and also Loa Loa, we can give diethylcarbamazine. So please take a look at this slide. It's a very good photo of how the life cycle correlates with the pathogenic effects of Oncocerca volvulus. So if you listened earlier as to where the adults and the microfilariae can be seen, you'll have noticed that they do not appear in the blood. That's why our diagnostic technique of choice for onchocerciasis would be the skin snip or the skin biopsy. Either the microfilariae or the adults can be seen from the biopsy of the nodes in the skin. Now the skin snip should be thin enough to include the outer part of the dermis, but not so thick as to produce bleeding in the patient. So for Oncocerca, the microfilariae exhibit no periodicity. Again, I would like to exaggerate that you can collect skin snips or skin biopsies from the patient during any time of the day. Now contrast this to Vucereria and Brugia, which have nocturnal periodicity, and Loa Loa, which is present in the blood during the day. So when you guys have time, please try to fill up this table by yourselves. Know the morphology of the worm, the location of the adults and the microfilariae in the host, the vectors, and also their periodicities. In other words, when it would be best to collect samples from the patient. I've already filled up the information for the filarial worms of the genus Manzanella because they won't be as relevant to our discussion here in the laboratory, but you might take them up during your lecture classes. Please also go over this slide and take note of the morphological differences between the different filarial worms. Our next worm is Trichinella spiralis. So this is a tissue nematode that can be found existed in the skeletal or cardiac muscles of the host. So there are two sexes. We have the male and female worms. The male worms have a single testis. And at the cloaca, there is a pair of caudal appendages or the copulatory bursa. The female only has a single ovary, and just like with the filarial worms, they are also viviparous or larviparous. So the larvae of Trichinella spiralis would usually be found encysted in striated muscle, and they prefer the skeletal over the cardiac muscles. So what they will do is they will actually change the genomic expression of that muscle cell and turn that cell into a nurse cell. So now the primary function of that nurse cell is to nurse or nourish the encysted larvae that is found inside it. It will start to form a capsule around itself and in some cases it might also have its own circulation just as long as it's able to care for and nourish the developing larvae. The life cycle of Trichinella is pretty straightforward. We start with the infected meat having been eaten by a new host. The meat fibers and cyst walls are digested inside the stomach and this releases the trichinae or the larvae where they will turn into the adults in the small intestine of the new host. The male and female copulate and then the female produces live young and those new larvae will now go on and penetrate the gut wall and go into the striated muscle and begin to insist there. So transmission is via ingestion of undercooked infected meat. The adults are found in the small intestine. The infective stage and also the diagnostic stage would be the insisted larvae. 
the clinical manifestations of trichinellosis come in three stages. First off, we have the enteric phase, which is when the new host has just ingested the infected meat. So this is when they will have gastrointestinal symptoms like diarrhea or constipation, vomiting, nausea, abdominal cramps, and malaise. What comes after that would be the invasion phase. So at this point, the larvae have already hatched from their cyst walls, and now they will go on to the different muscles in the body and begin to invade those cells. So the patient will manifest with eosinophilia and allergic reactions, and in most cases, they will have fever and chills, dyspnea, and dysphagia. In some cases, the worms might actually have erratic migration, and they can go into the central nervous system, particularly in the brain, and also in the lungs. Next is the convalescent phase. So at this point, especially when the patient has an intact and good responsive immune system, then we expect that there will be full recovery of the patient. However, in cases where the larvae were actually able to insist in the brain tissues, the patient might experience residual neurological damage. So this is when patients might have recurrent headaches or seizures or encephalitis. So because the L3 larvae are found insisted in the muscles, of course, our definitive diagnosis will be arrived by doing a muscle biopsy. Now to be able to get a greater yield or to be able to visualize the larvae more clearly, we can do digestion techniques with pepsin and hydrochloric acid. However, the current recommendation for diagnosis would be to do ELISA, and we also have adjunctive tests like the CBC, to try to detect eosinophilia and also measuring the amount of the muscle enzymes like CKMB for the cardiac muscle and CKMM for the skeletal muscle. We can also try to detect or measure the amount of total IgE, which would reflect the presence of parasitic infection in the body. And lastly, we have the Toxicara species. So for this discussion, we have two species, T. canis, which is known as a dog roundworm, and T. cati, which is the cat roundworm. So one of the distinct morphological differences that they have would be their cervical alley. So for T. canis, the cervical alley are narrower, so that is what is pointed here at the picture on the left. And then for T. cati, their cervical alley are broader, and there are very fine, very small striations along the border of its cervical alley. So for Toxocaracati, they usually have an arrow appearance to the anterior or the cephalic portion of the worm. So the ova of both species look very similar. They're passed during the 1-2 to two cell stage. They're golden in color, and they're spherical to pear shape with a thick shell and a pitted surface. So if you look at these photos here, you'll see that there are small holes on the surface of the ova, and that's why they're said to have a golf ball appearance. Just to take note, in the life cycle of Toxocara, there can be different paratenic hosts involved. So the paratenic hosts are mammals that includes livestock like the pigs, the cows, and also humans and rabbits. It also includes rodents and even birds. Now, the life cycle of Toxocara is quite complicated. It has a direct life cycle, which involves only the definitive host, so that's the cat or the dog, and also it has an indirect life cycle, which involves the definitive host and one or two or three paratenic hosts. So there are multiple hosts in the indirect life cycle. So let's start off with our definitive host, which again would be the cat or the dog. They are able to pass unembryonated eggs in their feces. Again, it's only from the definitive host that we will be able to see the eggs of Toxocara canis or Toxocara cati. So the eggs embryonate in the environment and become infective. So at this stage, they bear the infective L3 larvae. Following ingestion by a definitive host, the infective eggs hatch and the larvae penetrate the gut wall. So in younger dogs, and also in younger cats, the larvae migrate through the lungs, bronchial tree, and esophagus. 
where they are coughed up and swallowed into the gastrointestinal tract. Adult worms develop and oviposit in the small intestine. Okay, so this is for the younger cat or younger dog. However, if an older cat or dog has ingested the infected ova or infected meat, then egg-producing infections can also occur, but more often, the larvae will be released from the infected meat or from the egg, and they become arrested in tissues. So they penetrate the gut wall and go on and insist in different tissues within the older definitive host. So that can be in the liver, in the spleen, in the eyes, etc. The arrested larvae are reactivated in female dogs or cats during late gestation and may infect their puppies via the transplacental route. They can also be present in the breast milk of these cats or dogs and that is how also they can infect the puppies or the kittens of these definitive hosts. Man can become infected when we ingest the embryonated ova that contains the L3 or the infected meat from a parotenic host that also contains the L3. So that's why humans can be considered as accidental hosts because we're actually not supposed to be part of their life cycle. We're also the dead end host because that means that unless some other animal will start to eat the infected meat of a man, then the life cycle of Toxocara cannot continue. We're also paratenic hosts because once man has ingested the L3 larvae, they don't undergo any further development into the adult worms once inside the human host. So please take note that the adults are found in the small intestine only of the definitive host, the infective stage is the embryonated egg or the encysted larvae, which contains the L3 larvae. And the diagnostic stage in man would be the encysted larvae in the different tissues of the human. So again, this can insist in the liver, in the spleen, eyes, lungs, even in the muscles. Now you've noticed that Toxocara likes to insist in different tissues within the body and not just in muscle. This is why it's known as a causative agent of visceral larva migrants. Please take note that this is different from the cutaneous larva migrants that would be exhibited by infection from your hookworms. So in visceral larva migrants, we will be able to see eosinophilic granulomas caused by the migration and subsequent death of the larvae in the different tissues and organs. Wheezing is the most common sign, usually accompanied by bronchospasm. So patients might have a manifestation that seems like asthma, but it's actually a parasitic infection. In most cases, there would be hepatomegaly and hepatic necrosis. Some less common clinical manifestations include ocular larva migrants, covert toxocariasis, and neurological toxocariasis. Because the L3 larvae are seen in the different tissues of the human host, then our gold standard would be diagnosis via tissue biopsy and we'll be able to see the encysted larvae. There are other methods also. We can do serology, particularly ELISA, and also Western blot. So that is the end of this discussion. If you guys have any questions, feel free to message me. And other than that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.